Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jordan Hamilton, and this is my presentation on the Game Controller and its evolution throughout its life. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to be abridging things a bit, because if we covered the entire history of the controller, we'd be here all day. So, we'll stick to what many people consider the best consoles <coughs> of the home market. So, show of hands, when you think of a game controller, the, how you control the character, how you make the world move before you, how you interact, what do you think of? Do you think of the PlayStation DualShock controller? The Nintendo Wii Remote with its motion sensing? The classic Nintendo Entertainment System, GamePad. The PC's keyboard and mouse. The various amounts of VR controllers that are very popular these days. Or perhaps the grandfather of all of these, well, not the PC, but the Atari 2600. Well, actually, that last statement's something of a misnomer. The first game controller is actually this thing, which is a modified radar controller which played a game called Tennis for Two, made in 1958. Quite a humble beginning for the industry, wasn't it? Oh. <laughs> but before home consoles can be talked about, we have to talk about the point where consumers at large got to play video games regularly. The arcade. So, when you think of the arcade, you probably think of the classic cabinet, where a screen is built into a box, and you have a lot of controller methods. But, the first few were actually not electric machines. They were basically uh, toys inside a glass box with things like Sega's Periscope in 1966 using only lights and pop-up plastic parts. But, soon enough, we come to the machines that most people are used to which have used a lot of various control methods, such as Pac-Man's joystick and button setup, light gun games such as Duck Hunt, and even double stick shooters like Smash TV, where you use only sticks to control the game. And unique to arcade machines are virtual reality simulations and driving sim games, which use controller methods that let you control a car as if you were really driving one. Daytona USA being a standout example of the medium. So, finally we come to the home console. And, of course, we couldn't start anywhere else but the Atari 2600, largely regarded as the one that made the medium popular. Look at that, very humble beginnings. Wood panel console, a single joystick, and a single button. That's all you had to play all the games on the Atari, but despite their primitive nature, it was very popular for the time, and games like Frogger, Pitfall, and Pong 
were all extremely successful. However, the market was quickly oversaturated, both by money-hungry developers making very bad, bad games and consumers returning the games en masse. E.T. and Pac-Man particularly, particularly were so infamous that they were returned almost 90% of the time and had to be buried in a landfill in New Mexico. And so the video game market crashed in 1983 in North America. However, across the sea in Japan, the video game market was still going strong, with the leader of the pack being Nintendo, with their Japanese family computer, or Famicom for short. In order to sell it in the West, however, they rebranded to the Nintendo Entertainment System, disguising it as a toy, toy box, which was used as something of a Trojan horse. Now, in this generation, as you can see, we're far past the Atari 2600's joystick and single button. This controller, meanwhile, used a double button setup, which allowed for actions such as jump and attack to be used simultaneously, a D-pad instead of a joystick, which allowed for precise movement in a 2D space, and a start and select button, which allowed the the player to pause the game or make more complex menu selections. Also notable, in Japan's Famicom system, there was a built-in second controller which contained a microphone, and this allowed you to do contextual commands, such as in Legend of Zelda, to kill the enemy Pulse Voice, or Takeshi's Challenge, which, well, All credit to Beat Takeshi for uh, using the, the hardware for innovative ideas, but those were the only hints that were available in that single game. A good, to get, a good game designer, he was not. So, with, with the 8-bit generation passing, soon the 16-bit generation <coughs> arrived, and with it, another competitor entered the mar market more competitively with Nintendo. Sega, with their Sega Genesis, and Nintendo soon followed behind with the Super NES. There's their controllers for the console there. You can definitely see the improvement on the controller with more additions being added rapidly. The Sega pad, however, did not add too much to the system. Only a single button and a D-pad, which kind of encaved in, allowing your thumb to rest in a circle. This made for very good fighting game inputs, but it couldn't compare to the Super Nintendo's innovation, which came with two additional action buttons and two shoulder buttons, which allowed for even more input into the game world. Games were becoming more complex rapidly, and technology was advancing for the games proper. And with that, it comes to the 3D era, where, where 2D input with the D-pad was no longer viable. In this generation, Sony, Sony joined the race with their PlayStation, joining competitors Sega and Nintendo's Sega Saturn and Nintendo 64. Sadly, the Sega Saturn would eventually lead to Sega's demise in the industry, leaving Sony and Nintendo the front runners of the race. The first controller that's unique is the Nintendo 64, which as you can see, 
carried with it the, the analog stick, which allowed for fidelity and control unlike anything the game industry had ever seen. Using it in games such as Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie to control a character with uh, precision unlike anything else. Meanwhile, Sony did not really change that much on initial release, sticking to the Super Nintendo's D-pad style. However, they soon fired back with the DualShock 1, which had two sticks instead of one, and it allowed for much more control and finesse in a game. In fact, the, the modern-day first-person shooter controls were innovated at this time in the game Alien Resurrection, which, upon release, was so different from what anything, what anyone had ever seen that it was actually called complete crap, believe it or not. So, coming to the next generation, innovation in the controller would kind of slow down and become more standardized. Sony and new competitor Microsoft stuck to the sort of DualShock design with their PlayStation 2 and Xbox and would follow suit in the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 era. Although, there were a couple innovations such as the PlayStation 2's pressure-sensitive buttons, which allowed for contextual control, and the DualShock sticks began to be able to be clicked which allowed for the R3 and L3 buttons to be used. Meanwhile, however, Nintendo, while sticking sort of to the same, fo same formula with their GameCube controller, decided to tap into a new blue ocean for, with their Nintendo Wii and its Wii Remote and Nunchuck. This device sought to allow motion control for actions that allowed you to fully immerse within the game, such as swinging a sword, shooting a bow and arrow, going bowling, and many, many other sort of motion controls. It was quite an innovative controller, and it showed with how well it sold with casual consumers. Seeing that success, Sony and Microsoft actually struck back with the PlayStation Move and the Kinect, respectively. The PlayStation Move, by itself, isn't really worth noting. It's just kind of a Wii Remote 1.5, if you will. But the Kinect is far more interesting because it had no controller making you the, the center of attention and how you control the game. However, it's something of a joke amongst gamers nowadays because the technology just wasn't there yet and it was imprecise and could bug out very easily. That being said, it was innovative for other technology such as Amazon's Alexa and virtual reality technology. Uh, hold that thought though on virtual reality. Now, not all controllers were very successful on their initial launch. As we discussed with the Kinect, uh, it wasn't easy for a lot of people to innovate and catch on as a successful thing. Exhibit A, of course, is the Wii U from the previous generation of consoles, which came with a tablet screen that allowed you to take your game off the TV and into the controller, allowing you to play it somewhat portably. It also allowed for very unique five-player gameplay, which no console had before then. But it was marketed very confusingly, and many people thought it was just a controller add-on for the Wii. So it flopped, sadly. Also, the, rain, the portability of it was limited because it had to be kept within a 100-foot range of the TV. So its applications weren't exactly there. Now, we brought up virtual reality before, uh, which was catching on around the end of the 360, PS3, and Wii era. However, it wasn't the first crack at it by any means. 
For example, Nintendo also put out the Virtual Boy. This thing is, was marketed as a portable console. Spoilers, it wasn't. And it made people's eyes hurt because it only displayed images in red and black. Very, very... Mm. So, we come to the modern day, and this is where things get really interesting. The big three of Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft are still standing to this day with the PlayStation 4 and its DualShock 4, the Nintendo Switch, oh, well, the Nintendo Switch and its Joy-Con controllers, and the Xbox One's game controller. Doesn't really have a name. They now Sony and Microsoft have mostly stuck to these two standard issue controllers. Although, Sony's DualShock 4 does come with some unique features such as the social media button on the left and the touch screen in the middle which allows you to move a cursor like a mouse and click down to select precise things. The real standout of this generation, however, is the Nintendo Switch which comes with two detachable Joy-Con controllers on the left and right and can be used to either put the Switch in a dock and play it like a home console on your TV, or they can detach from the main controller that comes with, slap onto either side of the Switch, and make it a portable console, thus becoming a very hot two-in-one console. Now, virtual reality is really interesting because consoles like the Oculus Rift or thus PlayStation VR are seeking to make you part of the game directly with stuff like the Oculus Rift goggles and the various VR controllers that allow you to move your hands like you're really in the game. It's games such as Super Hot where time doesn't move unless you do, and simulation games like Star Wars Battlefront VR, which allows you to get behind the cockpit of an X-Wing fighter, are gaining a lot of traction, but still require a lot of ground to really break into the mainstream. It's still prohibitively expensive, for instance.
That's only a taste of what VR could make. The technology is still imprecise, but it's definitely something to look out for in the future as technology continues to grow and expand. So, in conclusion, we've come a long way from the 1970s where the only controller you had was a simple joystick and button on a square all the way to a pair of controllers which come onto the main console and turn it into a portable system. And though VR is uncertain, the ability to truly control the game through our own motions, our hands, and through our sight, is a potential gold mine that cannot be ignored. There, remember, games are an ever-changing medium. The future is always uncertain in what the next big innovation will be. So, any questions? All right, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time.